Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back. So we'll just get right to it. Um, our keynote topic today is cultural tourism and modernity, Clay Kandinsky and Tunisian popular art. And our keynote speaker is Professor Roger Benjamin, Professor of Art History, University of Sydney. I think if you'd like more information on Spyro, it's actually in the deck that we sent. Professor. Could we have the spotlights off the, off the speaker, please, if possible? It's all about the art, it's not about me. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, very much the team here at the National Gallery for this marvellous invitation. I haven't been to Singapore for 20 years or so, and the transformation is extraordinary, not least this, this wonderful building. Uh, particularly thanks to Phoebe Scott for the invitation uh, and Lucas Huang and the team uh, for the implementation. Uh, in the exhibition itself, uh, which I was shown through by Phoebe, who I know from University of Sydney days, it was very moving to see the result really of some of her uh, early researches on uh, colonial Indochina being realised on the walls and that expertise being brought to bear in this amazing new institution. My talk, um, my talk needs to be in a little more dark, please. <laughs> That's better. Turn those ones down, if you can. Um, my talk today is about travel and art, uh, and travel, of course, to a cultural destination. Still too much light on me, sorry. I'm finding it a bit dazzling. Thank you. Travel. Uh, the kind of travel <clears throat> enabled, excuse me, by modern technologies. Uh, so the, the era I'm looking at is just prior to the First World War. Uh, between uh, Europe, not France this time, but in fact Munich, one of the great art capitals of Europe at, at that moment. Uh, and travel with a particular cultural destination in mind that was enabled by, at this point, steam power. It was steam power that drove the, the trains that took Kandinsky and Clay and their friends uh, from Munich uh, to the, uh, the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and then they took steam ships across to uh, Tunisia. Uh, and you see here a map of uh, Northeastern Tunisia, ringed in blue, are the two main places I'll be talking about. The city of Tunis itself at the top, and the holy city of Kerouan on the lower right hand side. In this exhibition, um, the theme of travel is, is really ever present. Uh, artists upstairs, um, the artists from Southeast Asian countries <laughs> to older countries, not older countries, but countries in Europe, France, Holland. Germany to the USA in some cases for the Filipino artists. And this travel was occasioned by a professional formation, uh, took, which took place, as I'm sure Phoebe mentioned, within a colonial context and colonial networks. So the artists Le Fo or Georgette Chen uh, are good examples of this. There's also travel, of course, within Europe from uh, the, an eastern country like Russia, many of the artists that you see upstairs who've come from Paris, Chagall, Goncharova, Kandinsky and others, de Stael, um, went from Eastern Europe to the great artistic capital that we've heard was Paris uh, in the early 20th century, and then uh, travel within um, the spaces of, I guess, nation states in formation or colonies in this region. So Sunasa travels from, um, from as it were, mainland uh, Indonesia uh, across to Papua. Uh, Atlan uh, travels from North Africa as a colonized person to France. Certain of the avant-garde, uh, sorry, certain of the French artists, as we heard in the pr previous presentation, were travelers to North Africa. And as uh, Nicholas pointed out from Paris, strange as it may seem, what we now call Algeria was regarded as part of France, full stop. Uh, you know, that was the legal situation. Uh, 
Uh, it was part of La Plus Grande France, France, uh, Greater France. The direction of travel uh, is always relative to a, a locus of power, a focus of power. And I think we need always to attend to this, uh, investigating this kind of idea um, where the power lies will clarify uh, certain historical uh, moments and certain processes of history. And I agree with uh, John Clark's analysis on this kind of question. Now, upstairs, for me, the great, one of the great things about the show and why I find it very liberating is that there is, I believe, a balance of cultural power. So you have dozens of artists from this region uh, who are really well represented with some major works on show and each have between five and ten artworks. This pattern was also used for their counterparts uh, from Europe, but it seems to me the artists from this region sit secure in their achievement beside their colleagues from Europe. Um, so, uh, in a sense, the, the politics is that of a, a, an apparent level playing field in the rooms upstairs. <coughs> I want to just add um, a, a twist to poor Pablo Picasso to whom it would be better, than me, it'd be better to be struck in the face than compared to pa Pablo Picasso, as we heard. Um, in the late 1950s in Paris, I think by, by the collector Kupka, he was shown an intricate work of art on, painted on bark by the great indigenous Australian artist, Aboriginal artist, Yura Walla. And he famously said, all of my life I have been trying to achieve that. Uh, trying to achieve whatever it was that he saw in Yura Waller's painting. And it, it seems to me this is a testament to what I believe was the intellectual openness of these people that we're looking at, that I'll be looking at tonight, and the generation of Clay, who was their immediate contemporary. So Kandinsky and Clay and Maka and Munter um, were moving towards something that they couldn't grasp, uh, they didn't quite uh, achieve, but in doing so, they were they were opening towards the future, towards an almost a mystical openness. In the case of uh, Kandinsky, who, as you may know, uh, was very interested in world religions, in Buddhism, in uh, theosophy, and who penned that famous text concerning the spiritual uh, in art, which he began working on around the time of this journey to North Africa. In what I go on to show you, there'll be quite an emphasis upon photography. And this comes as a surprise because it seems to me photography is a great resource for this kind of work. Um, it provides for me a kind of way of knowing what it was artists saw and actually measuring just how much they were imposing some kind of European view or in fact were surrendering to the the, the reality of the buildings and the, um, the, the people they encountered and the sensory environment that they were moving in. Right. That's the preamble. Let's get down to business. Uh, upstairs there is a wonderful painting, a rare painting, um, quite small, uh, by Kandinsky painted just in the months before he left for North Africa on Christmas Day, 1904, with his girlfriend, um, his young, new young partner, Gabriella Munter. They were sort of on the run from Madame Kandinsky, if I, <laughs> if I can put it so, so unfairly. Um, but, but truthfully, really. I mean, they, 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 this young couple were trying to uh, find time for themselves. Kandinsky's marriage had collapsed in the previous uh, years. Uh, she was 24, I think, and he was um, a decade or so uh, uh, older than that, and was producing these works, which are often called his ethnographic works. Now, this is not a term used lightly because uh, Vasily Kandinsky, who, as you may know, was a highly educated uh, Russian intellectual, had trained, first of all, in law and ethnography, and his field actually were, were the, the legal systems of indigenous Russian peoples. 
So in the 1890s, he'd made a famous trip right up into the north of Siberia where he had um, interviewed and taken notes, made lots of colour drawings and was profoundly impressed by the life ways that he discovered there and the, the commitment of people towards, uh, um, uh, towards colour and towards decoration and towards profound belief. Uh, here are the two of them. They, they, um, they liked their creature comforts. They were tourists in the proper sense of the word. They were not adventurers. They used what were by now uh, very well established um, uh, colonial and commercial uh, trade routes to get uh, to, to Tunis. We know what ship they, they took. You know, we have photographs of it. Um, here she is on the left, Gabriel Munter, standing with a piece of uh, fabric which he, she has decorated <clears throat> with the pattern um, provided by her husband. So it was a work of uh, decorative arts of that time. Oh, sorry, not husband. They never married. Um, uh, bloke. Uh, uh, um, and here's her fine woodcut of, Gab of Kandinsky himself executed a few years later. I'm not going to be, unfortunately, I don't have time to look much at the painting of Gabrielle Munter, but I will uh, be drawing on her photography, which is very, you know, really the, the, uh, the epitome, I think, of uh, amateur tourist photography around this time. And here are two of the fine examples uh, of her work. She took 180 photographs in the period of their three-month trip using a camera exactly like the one here. And what you need to know is was that it held vertically um, in front of one's stomach uh, and you looked down and it took in the view um, outside. So they were often shot sort of at, at mid-height, uh, which gives a kind of immediacy to the, the figuration of people, such as this scene on the lower right-hand side. Um, uh, it's a kind of anti-Orientalist painting in that it shows... It shows um, um, a European man, um, a local, but of European, possibly Italian background. There were a great many Italians in Tunis. And a couple of women who've come in from the countryside, you can tell uh, because they're not wearing veils and they've come in probably to market. And at the top, um, her arresting image of two wealthy uh, Sudanese, uh, or black Africans presumably, <coughs> traders who are many levels up on the social echelon compared to the, the men crouching in the corner on the left-hand side. And this is an example of Munter's highly competent landscape painting that she did. Now, uh, um, in, in speaking of uh, the openness of these artists to the indigenous, the, the promptings of an indigenous aesthetic, I don't want to limit myself to visual artworks. Um, I want to also need to include in that uh, architecture. And we see here um, one of the most elaborate of the hundred odd sketch drawings that Kandinsky made in his uh, notebooks. And uh, uh, it shows the interior of the building that you see below. Um, it's called the Mida. And it was, funnily enough, um, it was housed in a, in a park that the French had begun developing as a public garden in the 1890s. Um, it was originally a, an olive grove overlooking the city. And the, when the French took control of Tunisia, really by um, sort of political pressure and economic pressure rather than outright invasion, um, uh, in 1881, they decided to make over parts of the city in the image that they wanted. So they built a, a large pleasure park. Um, you guys know an awful lot about that kind of thing in Singapore. Uh, and you needed a, a sort of decorative historical building. What they actually did was they uprooted brick by brick and transplanted the building that, unbeknownst to himself, Kandinsky was copying. Yes, it was a traditional uh, a Muslim building, uh, an ablutions block next to an old mosque called Amida. Uh, and it had some very fine decorative details that clearly enchanted the painter. And he made half a dozen drawn studies, some of which, like the one on the right, 
um, have quite detailed colour notes. So he's got uh, a numbering showing the uh, colour scheme that he observed, presumably uh, with a view to creating a painting um, later on after the fact. Also in this area, but we haven't quite been able to determine where, uh, Kandinsky made this fine drawing <coughs> of a, a, palance, um, so a panel of faience tiles. It's a kind of tile that was a, an art practiced above all in Tunis itself. They're called Kalalin, and it was a centuries old uh, decorative art tradition they provided these um, tiles that are still very popular across North Africa today and even in some parts of southern Europe where you have, um, in the Muslim context, you might have a representation of Medina or Mecca um, or a, uh, a sort of fantasy mosque um, or else uh, these vases that are open to the sky um, which is a source of, of blessing and benevolence. So. Um, we have to say, look, here is um, the artist who's meticulous. He's a former ethnographer. Uh, he's already um, aware of, from his time in the museums of France uh, and Germany, and indeed the Russian royal collections, he's aware of and open to the promptings of uh, Muslim art that he saw there. However, the paintings are really quite close to the mode that we saw in the Volga Boat Song, except those paintings, which are often associated with Russian or German folk tradition, are sort of works of historical imagination. Now we know um, Kandinsky was painting what he saw in front of him. And this sort of reversion from um, a mode of imagination in the studios of Europe to a mode of observation on the trip is something that, that many artists did uh, traveling between countries. Matisse did it himself when he went to North Africa. Now, for a long time, nobody knew what the subject of this picture was, other than that it was called Working Negroes, and it was shown in the Paris Salon d'Automne in 1905. Um, the one thing I would like to say is that uh, what you're hearing today is a kind of condensation of this book, which recently came out. Uh, and that you'd, you'd all be most welcome to buy at great expense. Um, <laughs> Kandinsky and Clay in Tunisia. Um, it's published by University of California, California Press. And in it, we, you know, we, we sort of publish, for example, um, an imagery in support of the paintings that were hitherto mysterious. So um, now I'm not saying for a second these are the men that appear in Kandinsky's painting. But what we're looking at, um, I know from actually talking to people in Tunis itself who know their history very well, in Tunis there was a, a, um, a kind of corporation of people who did earthworks and they were called the Oaglis. They were descended from black slaves and they came from the uh, big oasis city of Ouagla in southern Algeria and they had a way of working in unison with big heavy timber staves tamping down the ground. So it's, it's how you made foundations before modern steam machinery and steam rollers and things like that. And there's actually a, a marvelous description of these guys at work by Guy de Maupassant when he visited Tunis in, uh, in 1892, whenever it was he was there. So we're now able to say that surprisingly, this is simply a team of men at work. Their mouths are open because they're singing. And of course, Kandinsky, as you may know, was very interested in music and in the synesthetic aspect of music, that song and sound and music could give rise to feelings um, about, uh, about color and line and movement. Um, this was a, sp a sphere he was increasingly interested in. He hadn't um, turned into the artist that we know, and a couple of things had to happen for that. One was that he went to Paris, where he and Munter lived for a year in 1906 to early 1907. And there, most certainly, he looked carefully at the emerging art of the Fauves, who we've heard about already, um, 
in the day, Matisse, and an André Durand, uh, which has, particularly Durand, the kind of colour scheme that um, the artist Kandinsky begins to apply to his paintings. A couple of years later, when he and uh, Munter were living in Murnau, which is um, a village in southern Bavaria, um, sort of an hour south of, of the great city of, of Munich. And they, she, in fact, purchased a, a small house there, which uh, is, a, is a museum um, today. It's called the, the, the Russian House or the Gabriel Munter Museum. Anyway, you can go there um, and get a sense for um, the life that she and Kandinsky and their various art, artist friends pursued up until the onset of the First World War. So it had been, what, uh, five years since Kandinsky had been in North Africa, and yet at that time uh, he began to produce a series of quite wonderful paintings that seem now to have that transformative capacity that, that Picasso um, had hoped for. Um, Arab uh, Cemetery, <coughs> excuse me, um, and, well, going back to the main image itself, so the principle that's come into play that wasn't there before is Kandinsky is freely inventing with colour. And that's perhaps what he's learned from the most extreme uh, of the Durands and Matisses, that you can disconnect non, uh, you can disconnect colour from its mimetic function and you can invent freely um, upon the colour wheel in making a composition. But it's now possible to see that, in fact, what he did uh, those five or six years later was to look back to Munter's photographs. So this photograph here, and I didn't realise this probably for a couple of years of gazing at it vaguely, is actually that tree is this tree. That, that doorway to the, the marabou is this doorway here. And as you go through the staircase, um, the rocks over here. Um, the major part of the motif is derived from one of the photographs that provided a documentary basis in observation that they brought back. On the right-hand side, one of half a dozen photographs and drawings of what are called uh, turban graves, where the steely, uh, um, is this a nice little sort of phallic presentation here, um, it's, a, it's a, uh, a turban, the size of which reflects the status of the person who has died, uh, apparently. And you can, still, uh, you can still see these in the old Turkish Ottoman cemetery of, uh, of Tunis. So um, in, in a way, this is a preamble uh, to Kandinsky's uh, process of elaborating from uh, the visual promptings from memories, from memories consolidated around photographs, uh, from a range of different things. And as you may know, he's launching off into the kind of work that arrives um, a few years later. And this is one of the great paintings from upstairs, Impression 5, Park. Well, um, I was looking at this with Phoebe Scott, and it seems to me this is, a, this is one of his paintings of horsemen. Uh, Kandinsky, as he launches into what's called his abstraction, was undertaking a process that he calls stripping and veiling. He strips away the sort of material detail of objects. He, he veils objects. Um, and, but the form that remains, he's, he argues, is very important for taking the audience with him. So you can see a picture like this and think vaguely, oh, well, you know, this is, this is the head of a horse, that's the head of a horse, its body, its tail, its hind leg. And if that's the case, then this somehow is the, uh, the rider. And there's a blue cape streaming out the back as he thrashes his way across the countryside. And um, it is, I believe, one of those paintings that inscribes specifically memories of um, the horse riding that he marvelled at in Tunisia. He also purchased this strange little print that we can see here, 
Sidi Abdallah and the daughter of the king, uh, the daughter of the king of Tunis. So this is where popular art, in the case of Kandinsky, comes in. And this artwork is in the collection of the Pompidou Center, and we presume that uh, Kandinsky had owned it since his trip to that part of the world. And Munter. Uh, made a series of 30 photographs of a, an Easter, a Mardi Gras carnival, where there was lots of horse riding and indeed sort of military exercises, um, a number of paintings uh, and drawings by both artists reflected. Uh, we know Kandinsky loved horses, though he was never known to actually ride one. Um, he, he liked thinking about them and looking at them. And he made, uh, a, you know, really a rather stiffened, uh, starchy sort of gouache drawing at the top of Arab riders about to start off on one of their fantasias, which is a display of horsemanship. 1909, uh, this was a kind of intermediary. Again, a rider on horseback in front of uh, a sort of castellate building that may or may not have been inspired by his North African time. Um, so to summarize before moving on to uh, Clay, and what we have to do, I think, you know, the, the museum in inviting me to present this material to you is hoping that we'll make analogies between the experiences of these artists um, so Russian and German artists traveling to North Africa uh, without um, the moral weight of being colonists at the time. It's important to remember that uh, Tunisia, well, there's a nice definition of it by Clay himself. He says, Tunis is Arab in the first place, Italian in the second, and French only in the third but the French act as if they were the masters of the place. So he understands very well those sort of politics. And if you read his diaries, Clay's diaries, um, there's a lot of reference, continuous reference to political stresses in staying in such a place as Tunisia on the eve of the First World War. And when Kandinsky had been there, um, it was the moment when the Russian and the Japanese armies were fighting the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, and Kandinsky was very nervous the whole time in Tunis because his half-brother was in the Russian fleet that was sailing around the world to get to be slaughtered by the Japanese at the, at the Battle of Tsushima. Um, so, and he lost his half-brother in May of that year. So um, none of these things are disconnected. I would want to argue um, th that uh, the, the sort of global political process was now well enough known already that Kandinsky would go uh, every morning to buy the newspaper that had been wired over from France uh, to the local printeries. Uh, so that era of sort of global communication has begun. Uh, a decade later, August Macker, Paul Clay, and the guy who took this photograph, <clears throat> a rather little known artist called Louis Moyer, um, made a very similar trip. And it appears now that one of the reasons they decided to go to Tunisia is because their friends, Kandinsky and Munter, had been there. They'd been able to see some of their artwork uh, and it was a carefully planned trip. Clay had been trying to get down there for a couple of years for various reasons. Now, moving cr right along, what I'm going to do is focus uh, not so much on the Tunisian pictures, of which this is an example, but the, the pictures, I mean, not the pictures from the city of Tunis, not the pictures from Saint-Germain by the sea, where they painted, nor of Hammermet, but rather Kerouan. Kerouan, which was the, um, the great holy city, is still the, the great holy city of North Africa, um, the fourth holiest place uh, within Islam, I believe, uh, after Mecca, Medina, and Cairo. And here's a contemporary map of the city. 
um, showing these rather impertinent little arrows which are there to help us understand <clears throat> what features of the city um, the European painters decided to render into pictures. And I say render into pictures, uh, it's a process that had been underway already for decades. Um, I was very struck, and this is more or less true, that um, North Africa didn't have a tradition of painting, um, by and large, except in the context of sort of the decoration of, of cafes and some uh, private homes. So there wasn't really much of a tradition of um, topographical painting or landscape painting or portraiture as such, because as you know, uh, for religious reasons, as within uh, Judaism, um, Orthodox Muslims are, do not wish to represent the human figure or any living thing. The architecture is fantastic, and around this time, it be begins to become the subject matter for photography by a painter like Henri Evan Pohl, um, who travelled with his father for a couple of months in Algeria and Tunisia. And I love this shot of the dad sort of walking into the landscape with his camera on his back. Uh, it's a sort of classic tourist view. So you get the sense that um, exactly 100 years ago, people are doing much the same thing as they do today. They go to a great city. I mean, the selfie doesn't quite exist, but, but, but there, are, there are photographs by Evan Pohl of his dad which are almost like selfies. Um, and down here below, Gabrielle Munter, another example. Rend uh, what I want you to look at is the monumentality of this architecture, the rhythmization of the arcades. Um, these are ancient, ancient monuments. Uh, the Great Mosque of um, Kerouan was the oldest religious, it had been the oldest religious building in the whole of North Africa. It had been rebuilt on a number of occasions. So there's antiquity, there's religiosity and belief. And these things drove the young painters during their visits. And um, I think they were helped in their view of what was picturable by uh, the work of the photographers. So here's a a view across to Kerouan and the Great Gates. This now, I was actually tracking around here trying to work out where the Clay and his friends had been standing, because all three of them made a painting from more or less this same point. Uh, and what binds it together, whoops, go back, is this wellhead, okay? And the cisterns right and left, there it is again. And here, down here in Louis Mouet, is quite a beautiful rendition. Um, if you w wander around there today, you find yourself um, in the um, uh, École Supérieure de l'Administration, or something like that. So a sort of um, higher administrative college um, with, um, you know, with gardens and gates. And so it's all been um, it's all been lost. But the view across to the Great Mosque is more or less intact, and these great battlements of Kerouan, which are such a light motif for the painting, are still there. I mean, I believe that, you know, as a scholar, one benefits from going to the place, from, I mean, the more language languages you know, the more you can enter the inwardness of the experience and gesture towards recreating the experience of these young artists. Uh, we do have in Clay's uh, diary a few expressions of his wonderment as he wandered around outside. Um, I've got one of these little quotes for you. Wandering around outside the walls. Never mind, I can't lay my finger on it right now. He talks about uh, wandering around out alone by himself. He was finding his friend's company a little um, distracting. Um, and he describes the light 
the air, the heat, um, and the crispness of the this marvellous outline of the of the the silhouette of the the towers and the crenellated wall, the old battlements of this ancient city that had been kept intact by the French out of def as really a condition of their taking over the protectorate. Well, that's another story. But. And you can see here, uh, it's written reconstruction. That's because when he got back to Europe, um, for reasons that are not completely understood, Clay took a number of these drawings and used a, a scalpel and a straight edge and cut them into sections, usually in half, or not exactly half, but according to lines of force, if you like, within the picture. Um, so what we have today are two quite separate paintings that I've just used um, digital methods to recreate. And this, this was work that was done in the 80s by um, one of a number of wonderful German scholars of Clay's work. I want to draw a parallel uh, about this moment. So from an, a picture that's in the exhibition, this strange artist really f which the uh, uh, our colleagues at the Pompidou Centre have revealed to us, Henri Valency, who was a kind of French Algerian futurist who'd been working in Paris around this time and who's made this sort of quite bizarre uh, colour composition around the same time as Clay, not nearly as well worked out. Um, it's very tied still to natural appearances, so I'm showing you a photograph of the, the place that still exists to the north of Biskra, and it's where the Ores Mountains open up as if st struck in two by a giant sword, um, as one writer described it. Um, and you're suddenly in the desert and the first palm trees arrive and this is the scene that he's painted. Um, so there's palm groves in the foreground, the villages to the left and the right. And there, as you can see, the profile of the Rocky Mountain, really, as it exists still today. And these strange futurist sort of force lines, to use uh, Marinetti's phrase or Boccioni's phrase, uh, decorating the composition. So you, you've suddenly got a uh, high... Um, avant-garde visual experiment arriving in um, Biskra and its area um, at that time, just as it was doing um, across the way in uh, Tunis, in Kerouan. So one of the great monuments that most impressed the young travellers was this Mosque of the Sabres, which, funnily enough, again, not everything is as it seems. This is a neo-traditional building of the 1850s that was built with its um, cupolas in imitation of the grand style of several centuries before. Um, I don't think necessarily that the, the young men knew that. Depends how carefully they read their Baydecker guidebook. Um, but what we do know is that Paul Clay was immensely impressed uh, by the promptings of, for composition of this ensemble, the whole ensemble, seen from this position. And there are several paintings um, that deal with it, the most famous of which is this, red and white cupolas. These are actually tiny little pictures. They're like this, because they're watercolours with a little bit of white heightening. They're very precious. Uh, they were, many of them, almost all of them were shown uh, two years ago now at, uh, at the Paul Clay Centre in... Um, oh, bad slide. That's a good slide. Paul Clay Centre in, uh, in Bern, his hometown in Switzerland. And there's lots of publication on this, on this material. So w what we want to say is that, you know, Clay is, um, you know, beginning to realise a dream of what his art might look like and if you know your clay, you'll see that, yes, this is, this is the moment at which he actually becomes himself, aesthetically speaking. And it's under the impellent of an opening out towards an, a completely different culture, completely different way of life, but one that he found, you know, um, uh, immensely attractive and enthusing. And he writes about this famously in his, 
in his diary. Now, the one thing that we were able to show in the, the Bern exhibition is a series of watercolours that Clay himself purchased in, uh, in Kerouan. And I'll just quickly run through them. They're anonymous. We don't know who the artist was. There's four of them. One, two, three. I'm showing you three of the four. So there are three architectural caprices or fantasies. Uh, and then there's one figure painting, which I'll come to presently. So Clay, in the diary, says, um, at the end of a long day, we're walking towards the cafe quarter. We go into a cafe that is uh, decorated with the most beautiful watercolours. This is sort of pretty much verbatim. We, r we ransack the place buying. Uh, uh, and, and indeed, he bought four, and August Macker bought four, because they're visible in a photograph um, of his country house that was taken during the First World War. The Macker paintings have been lost, but the clay paintings have been published now in, first, in colour for the first time in this Swiss catalogue, and um, I had the privilege of writing the essay about them and trying to research them. Nobody really knows much about them. They're, they're anonymous. They're, um, I don't want to call them folk art. They're a sort of sophisticated architectural art that, as it were, riffs on the forms of certain buildings in the city, uh, such as, where is it? Here we are. On the right-hand side, this is the, uh, the most famous portal into the Great Mosque area. If you look at the what's called these blind, a, bl a blind gallery of little arcades at the top, crenellations, the dome, um, the domes within domes, the horseshoe arches. This is a visual language derived from Andalusian uh, Moorish architecture that the artist has you know, very delightfully investigated. And he's created these uh, facades, these sort of fantasy facades. Here's another one <clears throat> with a, a spiral staircase. Uh, that may be an allusion to one of the caliph's tombs from Cairo. Um, none of them can be pinned down, but <clears throat> what's become apparent is that they were uh, uh, probably a reflection of the high religious status of the city of, uh, of Kerouan. And then the one that creates the connection is this very weird drawing that I think Clay would have absolutely adored um, of, uh, well, we couldn't work. Who on earth is this character? Anyway, it's, it's the founder of a Sufi sect called Sidi Abdel Qadir Jilani. And he's shown befriending the wild beasts. Um, and it was purchased by Clay. So you've got. Um, a peacock, uh, an oryx, which is the native gazelle with its horns, the, the lion, and two lions and an eagle, sort of, a very, a kind of berserk eagle at the top. <laughs> so this character is important uh, in Tunisia, um, still historically, uh, the confraternity of the Kadiria. Uh, is an influential uh, mystic and Sufi confraternity. And they often took this motif of their saint calming the lion. Um, there's much more to say about that, but you can just see it down here, uh, drawn, the lions tied up are drawn on the buildings. Um, and both Maka and Moye purchased this very postcard, and it's in the family collections. Still, so there were, the, you know, these mural paintings were a kind of popular art that um, w was painted in this case on um, a saint's tomb in the local cemetery. Here it's a behind glass painting. Here it's a, a color chromo of the kind that could be um, put up in your household or in your uh, coffee shop or your barber's um, little booth. Um, in order to show your respect uh, 
for religious tradition and affiliation and identity. And I think it's, it's this part of that um, North African experience that we're really only beginning to um, discover now. Uh, let me conclude with a couple of um, hypotheticals. Uh, Clay did two drawings once he got home called In the Kerouan Style. And this is one of them. And most people had fairly assumed that the Kerouan style was this style of a checkerboard and a sort of quadratic style that he had invented um, more or less at that time. But it could be that the Kerouan style is actually a reference to these drawings with their sort of uh, repetitious enumeration of a facade and certain circular and tubular and um, rectangular motifs. Who knows? The thing that I do wish to assert more strongly is that in 1924, Clay seems to have come back a decade later to his North African trip and made a number of pictures that bounce off um, aspects of those experiences. And the one that I want to show you in this detail uh, is a detail of this extremely beautiful, quite large picture called Citadel of the Believers, Stadt der Glaubigens. Um, and if you go into the detail of it, what you'll see, if you're an alert art historian, is that every dome has its little half moon motif. Um, without fail, as does without fail, uh, this image of the city of the believers that was was Kerouan. Now, I mean, that only gets you so far. I mean, it doesn't tell you an awful lot about, um, you know, the visual character of these paintings. But what I want to suggest is the carpet aspect has also been written about very plausibly by scholars like Haxthausen and so on. What I want to say is that at the end, um, Clay's openness uh, to the promptings of, of other cultures uh, were, were profound. Um, it was not uh, uh, simplistic. And um, I believe it's, it's, a, it's a good example of the kind of openness across cultures that, that uh, we're celebrating in the marvellous exhibition upstairs. Thank you.